Bem-vindos a Brasília, a capital que, por meio de suas linhas modernistas, traçou o futuro de um país de dimensões continentais e enfrentou o grande desafio de integrar norte, sul, leste e oeste no desenho de uma sociedade mais justa, democrática e igualitária. Bem-vindos ao Brasil. Ficção científica do passado, capital das águas, quadradinho, avião, reconhecida por vários nomes. Essa cidade criada para ser a morada de uma burocracia que se alternava no tempo, um não lugar. Cedeu aos afetos e se transformou em lá nas mãos de seus habitantes e nas gerações que ali se desenvolveram. Gostaríamos de tê-los aqui conosco, compartilhando das belezas de nosso céu, de nossas águas, de nossa cultura, de nossa gastronomia e de nossa gente. Porém, os desafios trazidos pelo momento crítico que o nosso planeta enfrenta nos impedem de vivenciar esses momentos com vocês. Mais de uma coisa podemos ter certeza. Se a pandemia de Covid-19 nos afasta fisicamente, ela também nos aproxima ao nos fazer relembrar de que os desafios que a humanidade enfrenta necessitam ser enfrentados conjuntamente, reconhecendo que todos nós compartilhamos de uma condição que nos faz humanos. Se por um lado não estamos juntos, por outro nunca estivemos mais próximos em nossas preocupações e necessidades. Vamos juntos avançar sobre os problemas globais que se impõem. Vamos juntos construir democracias melhores, mais transparentes, mais responsáveis e mais participativas. Sejam bem-vindos à Conferência Internacional de Comissários de Acesso à Informação 2021. Queridas comissionadas e comissionados, integrantes de la sociedade civil, académicos e expertos internacionales interessados en el acceso a la informação e a transparência, los invitamos a sumarse e dar seguimento a nuestros miércoles de ISIC, adaptándonos a uma nova modalidade que derivou por la pandemia internacional. Nuestro anfitrión, la Contraloría General de la Unión de Brasil, nos ofrece a la comunidad de partes interesadas del acceso a la información presenciar diversos webinars que facilitan el intercambio de experiencias y propician un espacio de reflexión sobre los nuevos desafíos que enfrentamos desde cada una de nuestras trincheras. Estas actividades se realizan el último miércoles de cada mes. Entre los temas que serán abordados durante los próximos meses, destacan, entre otros, privacidad y transparencia en materia de salud, acceso a la información y libertad de prensa, así como los retos de la transparencia en los gobiernos digitales. Resalto que en cada actividad nos acompañarán expertos del ámbito global, académicos destacados, representantes de los órganos garantes provenientes de diferentes continentes y también representantes de organismos internacionales vinculados con nuestro quehacer. Los invitamos a consultar la agenda completa de la doceava edición de la ICIC en nuestro sitio web y redes sociales. No se lo pierdan. Thank you, Commissioner Ibarra and the Comptroller and the International Conference for, of Information Commissioners for those opening videos. Good day, wherever you may be. Welcome to this virtual panel of the International Conference of Information Commissioners hosted by the Brazilian Comptroller's Office. I'm David Banassar, Senior Legal Counsel for Article 19, and I'm the moderator for today's webinar on Blurred Boundaries and Access to Information, Home Office and Public Records Management. Today, we are speaking about an important issue of records management and access to information and data protection, with a focus on how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected it. The impacts of technology over the past 20 years have been immense and contradictory. Now, there is both uh, more information collected, but also key information is less likely to be captured or disappeared. 
Officials using private email or communications devices can bypass the automatic collection of information about policy and decision making, but not the legal obligations they must ha they have to keep and record it. Tools intended to protect the privacy of individuals and the security of human rights defenders working in difficult situations are now being used by officials to erase history. This trend has been greatly exaggerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. During the pandemic, many public officials have been working from home. Often their work is carried out with their own devices, including their personal computers, phones, and internet networks. Bring your own device has become your home into your official office. This has generated weaknesses in the security of government information and in the archival and disclosure of such information. Since part of those employee, of the employees started to save public documents on their private archives, difficulties in accessing official physical records or electronic documents not shared on public networks may be a challenge to ensure the access of public information during this period. This new scenario pause, creates new challenges for enforcing freedom of information and privacy. How to enforce the right to information in this context? What are the best practices on information management that can be implemented in this context? Is it possible to overcome the difficulty of accessing physical files? These are some of the questions this panel aims on discussing. And why is this important? As the former Information Commissioner of Canada once remarked, you can't disclose what you can't find. Last month, the ICIC with UNESCO, the International Council of Archives and other organizations issued a statement, the duty to document does not cease in a crisis, it becomes more essential, calling on states to do three major things. One, they must document all decisions. Two, they must record uh, the records uh, and data in a secure and preserved way for all sectors, not just with governments, but also commercial, research, and education institutions. And three, that the security preservation and access to digital content should be facilitated during a shutdown. The duty to document does not end in a crisis. It becomes more essential than ever. We have three well-qualified panelists to discuss this today. We'll hear from them and then take questions from the audience. You can submit your questions on the ICIC uh, Ombudsman and INAI YouTube channels, depending on which language you're watching this in. So let me introduce our panels. First, we are happy to welcome Rodrigo Mora. Unfortunately, Dr. Gloria La Fuentes Gonzalez had a conflicting event, was not able to make it, but we are very pleased to have Rodrigo. He is Chief of Staff or the President of the Council of Transparency in Chile. Among other positions, he served as Executive Secretary of Transparency at the Ministry of the General Secretariat of the Presidency and point of contact of Chile in the Open Government Partnership from 2014 until 2018. Next is Dr. Miriam Wimmer. She is currently a director of the National Authority of Data Protection in Brazil and has been a civil servant since 2007, working at the communications regulator, Anatel, the Ministry of Communications and the Ministry of Science, Technology, Innovation and Communications, as well as teaching as a professor of law at the School of Brazil uh, directo Publico. She has public ex published extensively about data protection, mass media, communications, and public communication and democracy. Finally, Dr. Anthea Celis. She is Secretary General of the International Council on Archives. Her career is focused on international, on data, digital records management and preservation at the National Archives in the UK, and is currently working on the use of artificial intelligence in archives. So let us begin uh, with uh, Rodrigo Mora. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, David, and thank you everyone for having me here today. Um, on behalf of, of Gloria, who sadly can make it uh, due to other commitments, um, I'm going to, to speak uh, um, especially about how, how COVID-19 pandemic has affect the right uh, to information and especially like like um, most public bodies worldwide um, we have faced uh, several challenges that require a quick response and implementation um, besides having to adapt internally in terms of human and technical resources to work remotely 
one of our main challenges was implementing the necessary regulation modifications or guidance for the Chilean public bodies to keep guaranteeing the right to access to information, even in the context of the pandemic. Um, and it, from the very beginning, I have to say that the Council of Transparency has stated uh, that the right of access to information was not suspended due to this emergency. And also that the exceptions for, for Freedom of Information Act, uh, our lay, the transparencia shall be temporary and limited, daily justified and analyzed on a case by case basis. So we um, are issuing right now and uh, taking several measures to adapt to the challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we consider three separate approach, uh, a regularity or approach uh, where uh, administrative resolution mainly are intended to provide guidance and best practices uh, to administrative bodies to fulfill their transparency obligations. And secondly, a promotional approach. And thirdly, an internal approach uh, destined to our public officers in terms of, of uh, keeping the public records and, and, and classify it, uh, it uh, in good terms. Um, I want to highlight one of the, of the measures adopted by the Chilean Transparency Council, uh, Transparency Council due to uh, COVID-19 is the resolution 252 on the fulfillment of the transparency laws dispositions concerning the COVID-19 pandemic and the constitutional state of emergency. As a key aspect, I have to say that um, we take a, a, a reaction after two days after the decree of a state of emergency in March 20 of the 2020. And we aim to provide guidance for the better compliance of the law under the pandemic because uh, we face a lot of danger in terms of, of, of an adequate uh, our policies to uh, to the fact that the the, the presentiality has not been um, enforced adequately. So uh, it refers mainly to the request to the third party's notification in case of being affected by an information request, to the protection action, uh, to the proactive transparency obligations under complaint procedure, to the informant procedure, and last, the sanctions. The most important thing here is in terms of the request of public bodies information in general, uh, we issue a guideline uh, in terms that to recommend that the public bodies must adopt a flexible approach regarding terms applicable to citizens that request information. For instance, when information requests need to be amended. In case of public bodies impossibility to comply with the terms established in the law, the, uh, we, we issue a recommendation in terms of uh, recommend uh, that they need to provide immediate notice to the requester of the situation, indicating him that a new deadline uh, is, is going to be uh, made in, in which he will receive the response. In terms to the action of protecting the right to access to information, the council indicated that the action based on lack of response could be concluded with the public body's proof that it has given due notice of the delay to the requester, following with the guideline provided in, in the resolution. So we try to, react, uh, to, to, to make a reaction very quick. Uh, but I have to say that no protocols have been issued to allow access to document in physical format uh, because we have uh, a conflict uh, with the National Archive in terms of uh, public competence. But progressively, depending on the health regulation, the public officials have been assigned to provide such information and has, uh, it has uh, been our recommendation lately. And in general, the response uh, has consisted in, in deferring the delivery of the information, most, uh, uh, in most of the cases. And the IT standard for Chilean public workers is now to work on cloud-based uh, operating system and to implement session recording and electronic signature, for example. 
And even uh, when a significant uh, delay has been noticed, uh, I have to say, especially at the subnational level. And regarding the publication of proactive information, the policy of interoperability it has been key. And finally, regarding the, uh, the, the context of, of the pandemic and the uh, recommendations have been made in the records management model of the RTA, uh, RTA, uh, many public offices are working remotely. Um, we recommend to review or adjust document management policies in pandemic and eventually adjusting or reassigning roles, responsibilities and competencies uh, to specific officials or units. And finally, review electronic documents management procedures. Um, thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, next, let's go to Dr. Miriam Wimmer to hear from a data protection perspective and how the implementation of the new Brazilian data protection law has been uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, Dr. Wimmer, please go ahead. Thank you very much, David. Thank you also to the Brazilian Comptroller's Office for the kind invitation to take part in this panel. I'm delighted to participate in this discussion alongside with you, David, and with the other distinguished speakers, Rodrigo, Anthea. I very much look forward to the discussion. Um, and in fact, I'm speaking today from the perspective of a data protection authority, and I realize this is perhaps a perspective that is a bit different from uh, those brought by the other speakers. And just as a context note, I think that it's very common, it's very recurrent for us to uh, have to face the challenge of balancing freedom of information and privacy protection. This is something that is, is very recurrent in our day-to-day -day activities. And although it's possible, of course, to argue that there is no fundamental incompatibility between these different uh, laws, freedom information laws and data protection laws, it's, it's true also that in the day-to-day -day operations of a public organization, it's very common to come across situations in which it's not clear which interests should take precedence or how to balance these competing interests. And in this sense, I'd just like to begin my statement by mentioning that it's really important for us to begin working in a cooperative manner in order to develop these parameters that may help public officials to make these tough decisions, taking into account that while there is often a public interest in the disclosure of information. There's also a public interest in protection of privacy. So we are not discussing, in fact, a competition between a public interest and private interests, but in fact, competition between two different sorts of public interests. And in fact, a recent work in, in the legal field has highlighted that privacy also has a social and collective dimension since it enables people also to enjoy other fundamental rights and I think this is in fact a very challenging background for our discussion on these blurred boundaries when we are facing a global pandemic and when many public officials are working from home. I'd also like to begin by mentioning that in fact the pandemic has provided for a huge impact in the field of privacy and personal data protection and perhaps one of the main reasons is that that it also brought upon us uh, an increased need for data collection and also data sharing. And this is true both in the private and also in the public sector. So in first place, we all witnessed an increase in, data, in personal data collection, personal data sharing with the purpose of controlling the spread of the pandemic. And so we realized, first of all, that there was a need for data sharing for the purpose of healthcare and scientific research, but also uh, many public, offic public officials all over the world began adopting policies to try to contain the spread of the virus. And thus we witnessed, uh, for example, the, the use of gel localization technologies, tracking, contact tracing, using Bluetooth signals, for instance. Uh, we saw some countries using CCTV mechanisms in order to enforce the use of masks, for instance. Um, more recently, we've seen mechanisms based on technology to enforce quarantine observance. And also, I think a, a very recent discussion, something we will be increasingly seeing moving forward, is the issue of immunity passports and mechanisms of making sure people have, in fact, taken their vaccines or already have some sort of immunity against uh, coronavirus. So this, in fact, uh, provided for many challenges for data protection authorities all over the world. And in fact, as we saw the pandemic reach European countries, we've seen important statements from the European Data Protection Board, for instance, and from, from other DPAs worldwide. 
And in fact, here in Brazil, as David mentioned in his opening remarks, ANPD was created very recently. Our law actually came into force after the pandemic had already initiated. So our law uh, came into force last September and ANPD was created only in November. So we sort of had to begin working already with the pandemic running its course and all these challenges already um, in place. But the second aspect of the pandemic, I think, is this increase in data collection and data sharing in order to enable work to continue, both in government and in private organizations. And I'd like to spend a few moments focusing on this issue um, because in fact, I think that one of the important consequences of the pandemic was uh, uh, the acceleration of this phenomenon of digital transformation that was already underway in many places globally and also in Brazil. So in Brazil, we already had uh, several policies in order to enable Brazil to gradually shift to an increasingly data-driven economy and a more digital government. But suddenly in a matter of days or weeks, businesses that wish to survive had to create an online presence, make sure they could deliver their products, handle consumer requests. And this required an important shift in the way organizations operate uh, with a massive increase in personal data protection. And for the public sector, this also brought a new set of challenges. So to begin with, uh, a number of public policies were designed to assist the more vulnerable population to face this pandemic. So here in Brazil, for instance, we had policies that uh, required the payment of emergency financial assistance to lower income families. And this, of course, required the government to enhance public service del delivery through digital platforms and apps, for instance. And of course, this also entailed increased data sharing and data processing within government. And also speaking you know, very concretely, as public bodies some, some suddenly had to close their offices with very little notice, civil servants also suddenly had to switch to home office and people were faced with a very difficult situation in which they had to do their best with the limited resources that were available. So continue working under very difficult conditions, having to make quick decisions in order to face the pandemic in a timely manner and work without the usual infrastructure. And on a personal note, before joining ANPD, I was um, employed at the Brazilian Ministry of Communications. And I remember seeing civil servants debate how they would be able to access certain files from their homes. Should they download them to their personal computers? Should someone be required to be in the office, you know, physically in order to be able to share this information with colleagues who were working from home? And, and I think that in general, we witnessed that as people suddenly had to migrate to home offices and, and begin using insecure devices, insecure networks, we also saw uh, an increased risk in terms of cybersecurity incidents and data breaches. And here in Brazil, this is also something we witnessed. Um, in fact, during the pandemic, we had a number of cyber attacks towards large public organization. We had ransomware attacks, we had denial of service attacks. And while of course it's not possible to say that the pandemic caused these attacks, I think it's certainly possible to say that they were perhaps enabled or made more relevant because so many people were depending on electronic access to these databases while working from home. And I think the main issue, of course, is that as we, we face these challenging situations, um, at the same time, the legal requirements and the organizational policies related to data management, privacy and security continue to apply when working from home. And so ideally public organizations would be able to provide their staff with the software and hardware necessary to continue carrying out their task with you know, up-to-date security resources, VPNs with end-to-end -end encryption. But I think the ideal scenario is very distant, distant from what in fact occurred in reality. And um, people were doing the best they could with resources that were far from ideal. And speaking from also from the perspective of ANPD, I can say that this was a challenge that we faced in a very severe manner, in a very intense manner, because we were created in the middle of the pandemic. So if creating a new body from zero, from scratch, is always challenging, I think um, this challenge is even more intense when we are in the middle of a pandemic, when it is hard to meet people face to face, and when we were facing, you know, very basic issues such as finding a physical location to be ANPD's headquarters, enabling a basic network infrastructure to enable us to share files in a secure manner, and of course, creating a, a team when there was very limited possibility for face-to-face -face interaction. Speaking a bit from the perspective of transparency and access to information, I realized that a critical aspect, as mentioned by you, David, and by you, Rodrigo, is of course the documentation of decisions and proper data and records managing. 
And I believe it's fair to say that in Brazil, at the level of the federal government, this problem was um, not so intense. I think this situation was perhaps made easier by the fact that most public bodies operating at the federal level were already working, um, operating with an electronic information system that allowed civil servants to access it remotely. So we, in fact, already had some policies for working from home and the pandemic sort of intensified and increased the amount of people working from home. But I think it's fair to say that both in the executive branch and the judiciary branch, there were perhaps already systems and mechanisms in place to allow people to continue working, you know, uh, in a sort of sort of normal manner and documenting their decisions and going through the, 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 the due process that, that is necessary uh, to, to come to legal and legitimate decisions. But of course, there is a challenge related to access to older files that were perhaps held only physically, you know, in, in, in you know, huge uh, store, storage de departments, huge warehouses. And in this sense, I think Rodrigo mentioned very correctly the need for flexibility when it is, you know, actually difficult to access files that are physically stored somewhere and that would require people to, you know, uh, expose themselves to an increased risk of contamination. Um, however, this scenario is probably not true for the over 5,500 municipalities in Brazil who are at very different levels of maturity in terms of IT adoption, digital government. And so I think it is probably true that we had many officials using personal computers to work. And this, of course, ends up entailing a mixture of personal and work issued email accounts, throwing out paper records without shredding, you know, you're using your domestic trash cans. Um, also an issue of holding phone and video conversations in shared workspaces or in a family environment. And this <clears throat> is an interesting topic because it raises issues on both sides. On one side, we see a problem of maintaining the confidentiality of government records. And on the other hand, also an issue related to maintaining privacy with regards to personal family life of the public officials who may sometimes not be eager to share their living or their family circumstances with their work colleagues or with the public in general. So I think, you know, as, as a closing remark before we move, move on to the debates and to the other speakers, I think um, I'd like to echo what was mentioned earlier in the sense that it's important for us to take into account and make sure that these exceptional measures adopted during exceptional times do not become the norm. And in fact, data protection rules and freedom of information rules are, of course, not an obstacle to taking the, the measures necessary to face this global pandemic, but also these rules remain in force and must be applied while we face this pandemic. And in this sense, it's important for organizations to begin moving towards the adoption of uh, measures to ensure compliance with these rules um, and respect for citizens' rights. And I think also in, in the longer term, in the medium and long term, it's important for organizations to begin discussing in a more serious manner what the policies are for working from home, what sort of strategies we can adopt in order to make sure that these different rules are respected and that citizens can exercise their rights, both with regard to freedom of information, but also with regard to privacy and data protection. So I'd like to close my, my, my early, my, my opening remarks at this point and give the mic back to you, David, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, now, finally, uh, let's go to Dr. Anthea Sellis. Uh, we've heard uh, the problems that both transparency and data protection officials have had in access and managing information. Now, from an archival uh, aspect, how do you see the issues and the impact of the pandemic? So I'm going to take a much more broad brush approach uh, than simply focusing on COVID because I think there are some persistent issues with regards to records management and information management that supersede the COVID epidemic and that will continue to be persistent as we move to telework. So it, it's going to be a bit more, a bit broader in scope. So firstly, thank you very much to ICIC, as well as the Brazilian Comptroller's Office for inviting me today. Thank you to everyone for their opening remarks and to my co-presenters, Rodrigo and Miriam, for their insightful and thought-provoking presentations. Um, so as David has, has mentioned, my focus will be on public records and the impact of home working on document creation, maintenance, and retrieval for access to information and protection of privacy reasons. So, I'll try and reserve my comments to the 10 minute mark uh, as we've been asked to do so that we can leave time for conversation. But I will say um, that the duty to document as uh, David has already pointed out at the beginning uh, does not 
peace in a crisis. And that was really the opening line to the ICIC ICA statement, which was issued last year as many of our organizations move quickly to home working. I really want to acknowledge our co-signatories, uh, our partners in that statement, Digital Preservation Coalition, CODATA, ARMA, Research Data Alliance, UNESCO Memory of the World, and finally, World Data Systems. I firmly stand by this statement and the exhortations that we, ICIC, ICA, and our partners made to public and private organizations to ensure that they capture and preserve information for accountability, transparency, as well as history. Without capture and preservation of records and data, which I'm going to refer to as evidence after this, we cannot hope to fulfill our access to information requests or our duties uh, as government officials. That said, I think that there are some pragmatic realities we need to accept about the current situation we are facing, and we need to openly acknowledge the perceived and uh, openly acknowledge the perceived value of information management by public and private sector organizations if we are going to attempt to develop a cohesive approach to decentralized ways of working that have been brought about by COVID. I will primarily focus on the public sector as that is what I'm familiar with, although I would hasten to add that public sector organizations are increasingly playing an important role in policy development and government decision making pre and post COVID. And how do we th hold those third party contractors accountable for roles in the environment needs to be considered if it not if it hasn't already done if we haven't already done so. My intervention will focus really on three points. One is that telework is here to stay and ease of use of IT systems to facilitate efficient organizational operations for hybrid working is essential. The, the value of information management in the public sector and public sector operations, along with enforcement of any policies and procedures or legislation that impinge upon the creation and capture of the public record. And I think that's where I'm really going to focus my point, because this is a persistent issue that has predated COVID and that will be, continue to be persistent in COVID if we do not address this. And finally, the potential uh, and constraints of emerging technologies in addressing uh, fulfilling information requests in these decentralized working environments. I think we need to openly acknowledge that telework or perhaps hybrid ways of working, which is both on-site and teleworking, are here to stay. Therefore, having systems that enable government operations, and I think this has been flagged as well by Miriam's presentation, and decision-making are essential. But there are important decisions that may be contained on these platforms that need to be captured. Trying to police have software as a service systems and have in-house bespoke systems in government is not the solution. And we actually risk creating overly cumbersome systems that will either be circumvented or will bring an administration to a standstill. And I think we already have issues within the public service around uh, government officials, both in the civil service and above and decision maker roles that are circumventing existing systems, which is already problematic and was problematic pre-COVID. In the pandemic, many of our organizations needed to move quickly to, into telework and utilize freely available SAS, as I call SaaS systems, things like Slack or uh, automatic chat uh, or instant messaging to facilitate decentralized ways of working. However, digital record keeping was not front of mind for many governments at this time. These free pieces of software also have may have limited extraction capabilities and it, the and in trying to extract important information may actually require users or government departments to buy quite expensive licenses. There is a definite risk in using these platforms of compromising not only the capability of governments to be held accountable, but also security breaches, which I think has been mentioned by both Rodrigo and Miriam, that can have wide ranging impacts on citizens and even national security. Too often the focus is on technology and the ephemeral nature of digital. But I don't really think that's the issue here. I think it's really down to lack of regulatory and policy structures around information management and information governance, governance. When we look at WhatsApp, WhatsApp is not the issue. It's the fact that we are not able to capture the information on those systems and that there's no policy structure that sits around it to enable us in, this, in the public service. There have been there has been a real undervaluing of information management function in the in the public service, and this has predated COVID. But I would, as I said, this is an ongoing issue. But what we are realizing now are the wide ranging impacts of the under resourcing of this function in the public sector and the commensurate impact this is having on the duty to document. 
dedicated information management teams do their best when they exist to ensure that civil servants, permanent secretaries, ministers properly manage digital evidence, whether that's on site or remotely. But more often than not, information management is seen as onerous and a nuisance with little upper management support to ensure compliance. It's a bit of a paradox because civil servants, decision makers, and ministers know that evidence needs to exist, be kept, and captured. But there is an inherent expectation that this is happening and ongoing, but they don't want to put the time and the effort in, as well as the resources to ensure the integrity of the process. So when we move into an environment, a much more decentralized environment, this persists. This, is, this all boils down to a culture of work that does not value digital evidence until there is a need to retrieve or find vital information. The information commissioner community, the data protection community understands the value of information. But when we start talking about the civil service, they do not see it as a core piece of their work. They often see it as a add on to their work and that it's quite onerous. And so this becomes an issue for us. We talk not only about the public record and what needs to be captured by an archives, but how to fulfill access to information requests, how to ensure privacy protection, uh, accountability and transparency. Digital evidence can be transitory, but as I said, I do not subscribe to the notion that it is critically endangered because of its formats. There are definitely challenges, but it's not necessarily with the media itself. It is rather with the perceived value of the evidence and its management by decision makers that critically endangers digital evidence and the ability we have to hold government to account and for citizens to assert their rights. Before moving on to my final point, I want to debunk a few tropes that I keep hearing when it comes to managing remote working and information management. Number one, a search engine is not a silver bullet. Elasticsearch will not fix poor information management kept, in, uh, kept outside of an organization, especially outside of an organization in proprietary systems or even within an organization. And no, you can't just digitize it all. You need to be selective because digitization, like many things, takes resources, equipment. And if you are going to do it right, you need to ensure that you have the right metadata and information so that you can retrieve the digitized materials. I'm not going to get into digitization and the destruction of paper records. That's a whole other presentation. I think there are some real questions when we strip everything back, which is what is good enough for the public digital record? What is good enough for the duty to document? I think that there are perceptions that we should capture it all and we can't. But, and especially when we look at the volume of data that we're already dealing with today, we already find it extremely difficult to understand how capturing it all helps us understand our history or even do access to information requests. I think that the real question for me around what is good enough is that we also have, whether that's arch archivists and perhaps uh, others within the civil service, it's we have this notion of perfection, that paper was perfect and we did everything perfectly in paper and that digital is somehow inherently flawed. I don't think it is. I think the issue with digital is that it's much more uh, apparent. It's much more evident what is being put, quote unquote lost. And I'm not always convinced that what we are losing is critically important. And I think really what the issue is, is the policy system and the ecosystem that sits around policy and enforcement, that is the problem. I think we will need to apply digital search technologies. You know, I say search uh, engines are not a silver bullet because they're often seen by IT and proposed by IT as a quick fix to information management problems and they're not. We, but we do need to come to terms with the fact that there is too much information for a human to review and emerging technologies and especially when we move into sort of these decentralized working environments, the amount of digital content that we are creating is going to continue to grow. So we need to get to grips with technologies like artificial intelligence that can help us to process data, identify key information for access to information and data protection region reasons. However, we need to understand how these technologies are being deployed and used to answer access to information requests, which means that we need to have a level of understanding of what these technologies do and what their strengths and weaknesses are. From experience and tests that we ran at the UK National Archives back in 2015 and 2016, we found these technologies did a really great job identifying personal data, so name, date of birth, social insurance numbers because these were natural language processing and regular expressions, which were easier and because they were easier for the system to identify. 
but I flagged the caveat around language because I was working in an Anglo-Saxon environment and that may not be transferable or translate to other contexts. Many of these technologies are controlled by a very select group of technology companies that were primarily in the Anglo-Saxon environment. Where these technologies did not do well, however, was around more context-based sensitivities. Information provided in confidence, national security, international relations. And these, uh, these are more complex instances where we actually needed human reviewers. And this is not an anodyne piece of work. This is still a substantive piece of work that we need to come to grips with. This can take a lot of time and it's a lot of expense. And from an access to information, public records point of view, ensuring timeliness of responses, it's how do we manage all of this? And how do we manage the scope uh, of what it is that we are looking for within an access to information request, especially if our, our information is spread across multiple silos due to decentralized ways of working. I think that uh, information, I think that uh, there's a, there are also a lot of questions about what gets missed out in this process of identifying information. You know, as I said earlier, it was never perfect in paper. So what is good enough for us, both in terms of record keeping and records discovery? How much risk are we willing to accept in terms of what is captured, what is not captured uh, as part of the, the record, the public record, as well as an access to information request? And I think more importantly, it is how you as information commissioners will scrutinize that process and the outputs of machine learning, uh, uh, machine learning outputs for access to information requests. You know, I can't get into all the work we did, but I think this is uh, a point worth reflecting on. And I know that you have another webinar on AI and transparency, so I won't dwell too much on it. In conclusion, I would say that what we need to deal with in terms of issues regarding home working in the public record is that this is an ecosystem. We need efficient systems and processes to keep government moving at pace, but they do need to be held accountable for the decisions that they make. I think really the focus from my perspective is on the value of information management and information capture, which is at the core of duty to document and needs to be addressed. We need the information management function to be valued. Units need to be properly resourced and policies need to be enforced, supported by efficient and effective information management technologies. And this is key. There are not always efficient and effective information technologies at information management technologies at the disposal of all governments and that can facilitate remote working. So we need to be mindful of this. I think the community needs to come to grips with the fact that automation of access to information and protection of privacy is not an option. And particularly when we look at these decentralized ways of working and the impact this has on the public record. And how do we deploy these technologies to best effect to ensure and enable accountability, transparency, as well as the capture of the historical document for present uh, research and interrogation. Thank you. Thank you, Anthea. That was very good. Um, I want to follow up. I mean, one thing that struck me, uh, you mentioned uh, on the paper uh, not being perfect. I, I remember as a longtime advocate for transparency, the horror we had when we discovered government officials were using sticky notes uh, to put onto the paper and then throwing away the sticky notes, or perhaps they would fall off or disappear. Um, and what we were going to do about that? I mean, I, I think we almost started a campaign to ban sticky notes from from government officials for a while. Um, but there are the sort of two big uh, things you said that I think maybe we'll throw back to the other panelists uh, because I think they they're sort of fundamental to all of the issues. One is the issue around telework is here to stay. You know, the world has now changed. We're all working from home, even when things go back. Uh, perhaps the, 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 the use to working from an office and, and the very traditional ways is has been fundamentally affected uh, in a way that maybe we won't be working all the time from, from home, but it, there's going to be a need for these systems. And the other uh, is the issue of the, the undervaluing of the important things of information management that affects uh it affects access to information, but it also affects information security has always been a, a problem for the last 40 years now. Uh, and 
and uh, all of the issues around that. So maybe if I could uh, throw to Miriam and Rodrigo, what, what's your thoughts on, you know, how we, will we come out of this pandemic someday? Uh, what are we looking forward to uh, from that? And how do we address this undervaluing of things that are gonna fundamentally affect uh, uh, the kind of work we're trying to do that the public expects us to do? You first, Miriam is probably first or you Go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh yes, I mean, I think um, that um, the, um, the reality has uh, created uh, a state of things in, in, in the public administration that is difficult to change in the future. I think the remote working is here to stay. Um, for instance, in, in the Council of, for Transparency, uh, we recently adopted um, remote working policy for all the organization. Uh, all the essential workers are there in the, in the premises. So um, it's very difficult to, to say in, in how extent it's going to stay, but I think it's going to stay and um, so the, the challenge for the record public management is very big, very big. Uh, the pandemic, at least in Latin America, it, it doesn't seem to, to, to fade away. Uh, and at least not in this very moment. So I think that uh, we're going to, to take some urgent measures in terms of um, uh, records management and, and digital transformation. I mean, this is very urgent, and it's urgent not only in the in the things that the that the that the the, the, the information commissioners can do. It's urgent in terms that the legislative powers uh, shall do. I mean, it is a it's a very urgent measure to take. This is uh, my my first remark. Hmm? Uh, Maria. Sure, I'd like to jump in to say that I fully agree that telework is here to stay. I think this was already a trend that we were witnessing uh, in government over the previous years and suddenly the pandemic accelerated this trend. And I think that while some organizations were quite ready to have a, a larger number of staff members working remotely, others were in fact not. So, so I believe there is a challenge on one hand on develop, developing policies for teleworking. And this includes not only pro policies related to productivity at work, to making sure that people are actually delivering what they're supposed to deliver in their jobs, but also uh, I think mainly the issue of training and improving measures related to privacy, security, and also access to information. So what, what I have realized from personal experience that is it's, it's very easy for us to, instead of using the official government software to use WhatsApp, for instance, or other instant messages, because it's quicker, it's more convenient, it's more similar to face-to-face -face interaction we have in office spaces. And of course, this is not ideal when you think of the decision-making process and the importance of documenting these, these, these debates that happen on why a policy should be one way or another way. So I think this is an important issue. And I think from the personal data perspective, um, also something we need to think about is that as we increase our efforts towards a more digital government, which is something that citizens expect from, from us, we also have to increase our, 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 our efforts in terms of promoting this uh, culture of personal data protection, which is something very new here in Brazil, at least, and perhaps in other countries in Latin America. So the idea that we should not, you know, just collect more and more data just because it's possible, but also think of principles such as purpose limitation, uh, minimization, um, adequacy, and of course, cybersecurity. So I think this is a, a huge challenge here in Brazil because sometimes we have the feeling that it's better to have more data just because it's possible, but in fact, this is perhaps not adequate from a personal data protection perspective. So, so I do think that the pandemic has accelerated a trend that was already in place um, and that now we have to deal with it more quickly perhaps than we would have had to dealt with it under normal circumstances. Thanks. Anthea, do you have uh, a uh, counter response? I think the only uh, sort of supplementary observation I would make is that 
when we talk about information management and particularly the implementation of information management systems, when we talk about digital transformation, it can't simply be seen as an IT issue. It is IT, it is, it is information technology at its core, but it, it's much more than that because my concern and when I was particularly in, in working in UK government was that the information management experts were cut out of those discussions and it definitely had an impact on the efficacy of the system after the fact. So I think when we look at digital transformation that might be brought about by COVID in central government operations, I think that needs to be kept in mind. All right. uh, we have our first question. It's from uh, Chris Albin, who's with the Filipino uh, Information Commissioner's Office. And he asked whether there are any jurisdictions. He asked a question really about social media and, and the public record. So at what point do social media messages, and I presume he means more public than, than private ones, uh, are considered public record, in which case they are accessible under FOI, or there might be data protection uh, issues around them, and obviously archival issues around them. Um, Rodrigo, is, what is social media? How does that affect under Chilean transparency law? Um, this is a very old uh, fight between privacy and access to information. Um, in terms of the social media, um, there are some resolutions from the Council of Transparency that uh, give some space to, to privacy. But in, uh, regarding the, the authorities or public officers, they are not allowed to, uh, to block uh, individuals or, uh, or, or, or try to not to, to, to deliver contents to, to, to individuals due to public functions. So um, we are we are trying to, to make a balance between privacy and, 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 and access to information that is uh, very difficult. And, and, and the higher courts in Chile are more devoted to privacy, of course. So it's, it's a, a work in progress, I think. Uh, Miriam, any comment on that? I'm not an expert on the issue of public records, but I would also like to comment that here in Brazil, we have had a debate quite similar to what happened in the USA on the issue if a public official is allowed to block followers on Twitter or Facebook or other social media. So I believe in the USA, there was a court decision stating that former President Trump would not be allowed to block followers because he in fact used social media to provide information on what was going on in government. And we have a similar lawsuit here in Brazil concerning the president, uh, Bolsonaro. So I think it's an interesting issue, especially because it's a very clear example of how these boundaries are blurred. What is a personal account on social media and to what extent do I use it to provide information that is relevant to the public in general? Um, I think this is something we're still working on here in Brazil. I believe the controllers, uh, the general controller's office here in Brazil has had some thoughts about this and perhaps produced some documents concerning the use of social media by public officials. But I think we're still at early stages of this discussion and perhaps I'm not the most appropriate person to take that question. But I think it is super interesting, especially since I speak from a privacy perspective and I personally would be very uncomfortable if someone wished to look through my own personal messages on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever. It, it, I think it's a very interesting point. Uh, Antia, how how should these be kept? Um, I think there is a very uncomfortable divide when you have uh, public organizations like departments that have Twitter feeds. Um, and I, I'm gonna focus specifically on Twitter because it's what we captured when we were at National Archives UK. So we were capturing uh, the Twitter accounts of uh, our government departments because what they were documenting is that it is a public record. So firstly, um, I think that it depends on the legislation though. So it depends on your archival enabling legislation. I would say that in the United Kingdom, it's quite broad in terms of what constitutes a record and it works in favor of the National Archives because it gives us quite a broad remit. I think in other jurisdictions where the National Archives legislation is quite bound, 
Um, there's a there's sort of a, a, a tension between the National Library and the National Archives in terms of who captures these, these types of things. And then in a final instance, I would say where the legislation is quite outdated, um, it's often either not captured by National Archives or not captured at all by government, or it's seen as the remit of the Central Information Technology Department, depending on what jurisdiction you're in. So I'd say its classification as a record depends on the enabling legislation. Uh, of the archives and how that is then rolled out in, in terms of practice within uh, broader government operations. At National Archives, we did capture the Twitter feeds of our departments. I think there was that uncomfortable divide that I talked about, and I think which Miriam mentions, around when citizens interact with government departments in these contexts, what is in and out of scope? Because the issue becomes in these environments, uh, particularly when we talk about freedom of information, they, they would be subject, but we're talking about public platforms that are already immediately available. The issue becomes from our perspective, a, a data protection issue because do we render these historical captures of the Twitter feeds of government departments and the exchanges that they're having with private citizens? Um, and uh, we were kind of working through that when I was still at National Archives. We had a bit of a takedown policy, so we would put it up. And if the citizen objected, then we would take that information down, but you lose context. And this is the same issue we have with data sets, where if you remove something from a data set as part of an access to information request, you lose the context, you lose the understanding, you lose the impact of the exchange. But at least from a government perspective, what it does show is that when did a government department share X policy? Um, you may be able to capture the likes and the retweets to see the level of impact it may have had um, from that perspective. But there is that sort of tension there. I think when we're talking about uh, potentially social media in terms of if you want to classify WhatsApp as social media, I don't know. Um, that is much more difficult in terms of capture because, again, you're dealing with also, even in terms of Twitter, these are private corporations that kind of interplay in the public sphere, which is my earlier reference to how do you deal with private corporations in varying degrees and uh, in, in terms of proximity to government that uh, act in a way that they have part of the public record. You know, we were able to capture Twitter, but there, there's still that uncomfortable divide there about how do I deal with material that's in WhatsApp? How do I extract it if it is relevant and it is documenting a decision? Because the extraction features are not there in WhatsApp, I've tried. Um, it, it's really difficult to get that information out. And in different types of environments, depending on the types of instances you have. So if you have a free instance of Slack, there have been issues where government departments have been using this exchanging information and making decisions. And then there's been an access to information request and they can't get the information out in order to process it, in order to render it to as part of an access to information request. They had to pay huge fees for a business license to be able to get it out. So these are the issues that we're running up against. And I think it comes to Miriam's point as well around, we need a better policy structure sitting around this to be able to ensure the capture. Great, thank you. Um... Okay, we have a question from Yara from the National Institute of Historic and Artistic Heritage in Brazil. Um, and the question is, uh, often governments disclose databases and after a short while remove them from the internet, what, which safeguards are available for the public to have continuous access to such databases and what can be done to properly his store uh, historical databases? So why don't we start? Take it? Uh, yes, I think everyone can probably uh, contribute to that one, but go ahead. Um, so this is, um, I think this is an ongoing issue. Maybe Rodrigo will pick it up from an open government, open data perspective. And it was it was something we ran up against when I was working in that in that sphere. I'll, I'll pick up the point around uh, the preservation of databases. So I think um, preservation of databases can be challenging because they can be bespoke, it can be quite crafty. And so what I think the important thing is what's the important part of the database? Is it is it the data? and the interlinkages of the data. And I think these are questions that we ask ourselves as archivists because we don't always have the technical capabilities to capture it in, in, its, in its format that you would have seen and used it. So I think the question from a public records point of view and an access point of view as historical document, it's how do we render it to the best of our abilities so that it's still meaningful to researchers and they understand why it was compiled and how it was used so that they can utilize it 
in the similar way. But it's not an easy question because databases are a bit of a, of a horse of a different color when it comes to the public record and preservation. Uh, Rodrigo. Yeah, uh, similarly, I, I think it, um, it's, a, it's a very challenging thing. It's, I mean, the National Archive for the Administration here in Chile, um, they do a lot of efforts to preserve the, the data management and trying to issue recommendation, but they have a, a lack of enforcement. So it's very difficult to, to, uh, to put resources, physical resources when you're not coordinating um, good uh, your, your the efforts, I mean, especially at the subnational level and municipalities uh, and, and regions, we have a great disparity and, and, and it's a very challenging task for the future, I think. Uh, Miriam, do you want to? It's, it's not really my field of expertise, but I do think there is an interesting aspect to this discussion, uh, especially here in Brazil, as we have a new general data protection law that many times we have seen uh, questions as to if a database should be published or should remain open to consultation or not when it contains also personal data. So we have in some instances seen public databases being removed because they had personal data. And there was a discussion if, for instance, if we have a public contract between you know, the state and an individual, if his information should or should not be published. We also have an ongoing discussion here in Brazil, for instance, if municipalities should be allowed or should be obliged to publish lists of people who have, have had access to vaccines. This is a very heated debate here in Brazil with judicial decisions going in, in different directions. So uh, I think coming back to the point I made earlier, and I'm not sure if this really responds to the question, but perhaps it adds another layer of discussion. Um, I think there is still the need to further develop these parameters that allow us to decide if in fact information should be made open and publicly available for anyone to access it, or if we perhaps should, should have certain types of public information that should be available under request or perhaps not in a digital format on the internet, but through physical archives, because again, there may be competing interests related to privacy, personal data protection, and freedom of information. This kind of raises a sort of larger question that all three of you have, have um, mentioned, which is there's a real problem around uh, the higher level policies and the availability of resources on this. So I guess the question to all of you is, you know, what is strategies that, that collectively all the different communities perhaps working together can do to reach the policymakers to, to build the ecosystem, the, the policies to, to facilitate the ecosystem that Anthea mentioned and to ensure that the money to put in decent systems so that uh, information will be collected, uh, information can be shared in an easy way so that people won't feel the need to have to jump to, to a, a private system where the information isn't collected in the first place and then of course it isn't accessible. So you know, what, are, what are some thoughts on how we can, so we can raise this up to a higher level? I mean, trillions are being spent on on recovery from, from uh, COVID, there should be a small percentage of that available to, to make sure that if, as the world's changed, we can, we can uh, still work in the same ways that we did before. Um, Miriam, you're on the screen. You go ahead and, and see if you have a uh, first. Um, I think it's a real challenge, David, and I mentioned earlier the issue of a cultural shift with regards to privacy, and I think this is something we have also experienced here in Brazil when our freedom of information law was approved and entered into force in 2012. So at that time, I was already working in government, and I remember that there was really a sense of panic as we realized that we would be obliged to provide information to whoever requested it, and we wouldn't be allowed to ask, why do you want to have access to this information? So I think um, at that during that time, we had, in fact, many training sessions, we had um, lessons, we had speeches given to us by experts in the field, the legal advisory bodies within ministries were in charge of sort of disseminating this new culture. 
And I think after a few years time, we, we did in fact learn to deal with this new law and, and realize that we have to be actively transparent and not only reactively transparent. Um, and I think that now that we face um, both the new privacy law, but also the pandemic, we have to perhaps go back to those basics and, and, and rediscuss you know, how to in fact make these laws effective in these different circumstances. And also I think um, trying to draw clearer boundaries because of this whole work from home situation and insecure devices and networks and cloud systems and so on to to perhaps deal with this new these new circumstances um, of course i think it's it's very difficult for governments who are facing a pandemic that is still not under control you know and civil servants who are still still dealing with very challenging circumstances trying to do their best with what they have i think it's hard to put these issues you know on the top of our priority list but i do think it's important and i and i have the feeling that as the pandemic slowly subsidizes, sub, subsides, and as we have, you know, um, better effects in terms of vaccines rollout here in Brazil, it will be possible to think of more structured policies and and uh, laws, perhaps, and, and legal requirements on how to balance these uh, these different laws with a new reality where, in fact, telework is here to stay. So um, um, I think learning perhaps from my experience when the transparency law came into force, we would be able to think of a, a way to move forward also in these new circumstances. Uh, Rodrigo, were, was there scenes of mass panic in Chile when the transparency law went into effect there? Yeah. Oh, I mean, it still is. <laughs> um, yeah, I think... Um, it's important, I mean, to, to have as um, a lesson for, for the present and for the future, maybe, the, is the fact that the that, uh, freedom of information law here and, and in many times Latin America have to be aligned with the center of government and uh, to implement and to, to uh, create stable policies uh, in time in, to, to, to face emergency times and to face normal times. Um, and this is very important to say uh, when, 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 you, when you talk about this pandemic, you have basic, you have key uh, tasks, you have key roles, you have key institutions. You have to, to go back always to the foundations, to the foundation of the institutional roles to, to know how, how to face uh, this emergency well. In terms of our access to information, it's a lot, lot of fight have to be uh, done to, to, to face, uh, to fight the secrecy and, and, and to enforce transparency. And it, it, it cannot be, I mean, forgotten. Hmm? So we have another culture shift. Um, beyond the privacy culture shift and the freedom of information culture shift uh, that now we have to deal with. Uh, Anthea, I remember, and we were in London at the time together when the, yeah. uh, when the, uh, when the Freedom of Information Act uh, entered into force in the UK. And yes, mass panic was a good way to describe uh, yeah. the, the officials there. What, what's, uh, what's your thought on the culture shift that's gonna be needed to the work from home culture to add on to the other ones. Yeah. I think, um, you know, when we, when we talk about how to better resource and, and deal with um, the profile of information management and government. And I think, yeah, panic is, is always, you know, it, you have, it's a peak though, right? You get like a little bit of panic and then it kind of tapers off and then we're back into the same situation. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there is really, it's, are there better ways to talk about information management and, and, and records management and access to information in ways that resonate more with policy and decision makers? And I'm thinking, you know, are there ways of looking at this from an economic perspective? What is the, the economic impact on a government and a country if, you know, the, uh, around access to information and, and poor information management? Uh, is, there, is there a broader risk that, uh, you know, how do we put this in a risk sort of matrices? Because that's what 
decision makers understand. You can go there and talk esoterics about accountability and transparency and the importance of documenting government decisions and the impact on citizens' lives. And they hear that all the time. And the thing is, is like, what, what is the message that we need to take? And I think there's a question around joint lobby as well between, you know, our the information commissioner community, the data protection community, the information governance community around what is the joint message we need to take to decision makers that they will listen to, that will resonate with them, and we can get the traction that we need to start a change management program because this is really what it's about. We have to change working culture. And that is a huge undertaking because I think that we have our peaks. We saw it with GDPR. We've seen it with, you know, access to information law implementation. We see it with inquiries in the United, in the UK. Dave, you, I'm sure you've seen your fair share of inquiries around record keeping and, and data protection and information management and other inquiries like Grenfell Tower that saw the, the complete lack of record keeping and the impact this had. And the thing is, is that we keep coming back to this issue and it keeps being repeated as a problem, but it's it hasn't been dealt with. And I think it's how do we tackle the problem as part of a broader lobby. That's that's my perspective on the issue. And that broader lobby, do we need to bring in the civil servants unions and, and other other folks? How do we how do we build out beyond our small uh, information communities into the into the broader people that are affected with it? Is I think that's a million dollar question, right? More rhetorical question, but yes. <laughs> Um, we have a, a reasonably practical question from the audience uh, from uh, Juliana Palm from Brazil, uh, asking around international best practices for archiving public documents in the cloud, uh, especially when civil servants are working from home uh, and how to promote uh, information security also uh, in those cases. I think uh, you're well suited to lead on this one. Sorry. Um, so I think that there, I would, the jurisdictions I would point to in terms of practices or good practices or sort of things that you could look at. I don't know if I would call them good practices, but at least sort of areas in the world where they've tried to address this. I would say uh, NARA, the National Records and Archives Administration, the National Archives of the United Kingdom have all kind of tried to, this is the early, I don't know if they've issued anything recent, but when the cloud started, be, started being used in civil, uh, civil service, they did issue some um, guidance around capturing material that was in the cloud. Um, I think the issue is around security classification. That's really where the, I think the cloud question comes into play around public record as well. So there's only, at least when I worked in UK government, we could only put certain security classifications like lower end security classifications in the cloud, not anything uh, that was highly classified. So I think that in terms of public document capture, is it an issue? I think the issue is that it's on a private proprietary system. I think that's the issue. But I don't necessarily think the cloud is a problem per se. I think we need to reconcile ourselves as it, as archives that we're not going to, we can't be data centers. It's, it's just not feasible. And so it's how do we make this a sustainable approach to capturing records that, public records uh, that are already in the cloud and also enabling our own infrastructures. Um, so I, it's a broader sort of practice question at this point. Um, and I don't know if I have a definitive answer. It's kind of waffling, I'm sorry. Uh, Miriam, I think we could slightly tweak that question to ask on data protection issues in the cloud. Um, do you see places where there are best practices on that? I mean, obviously legislation like GDPR uh, requires things be protected no matter where they are in the world, uh, if they relate to to European citizens, so you know where, what, who would you say is uh, you know doing a good job on this? I think there are a number of difficult questions associated to to this issue, David. And I think one issue is, uh, in fact, information security related to public archives held in the cloud. And of course, a, a basic issue would be to recommend that civil servants should not use their own personal cloud provider to store public documents, but use the official systems. This may seem funny, but in fact, I think it's very common for people to use their Dropboxes or Google Drives or whatever to share documents 
perhaps because the, the official systems are not actually in place. There is no official software to be used. So I think this is a, a very basic but very important issue. And from a personal data protection perspective, um, you mentioned the GDPR and our general data protection law in Brazil is quite similar in the sense that international data transfers are enabled under certain circumstances. And many times when government uh, chooses a cloud provider, there will also be an issue uh, of uh, the need or not to determine mandatory data localization within the national territory. So here in Brazil, we have certain information security rules that apply to governmental records. And I think in general, they have to be held in Brazilian territory, at least at the federal level. But of course, there may be circumstances, especially in exceptional times where people are, you know, using perhaps uh, other providers as well as the official providers, where there may in fact be international data transfers, which under the LGPD would have to follow certain uh, parameters, certain conditions to be considered legitimate. So uh, we have a challenging situation in Brazil at this point because the law is in force, but the regulatory framework is still not complete because ANPD was created only six months ago. So there has not yet been time to have adequacy decisions or to issue standard contractual clauses or binding corporate rules or any of those other mechanisms. So I think there is a, a problem related to personal data protection, which is a result of our still uh, very uh, early scenario in terms of data protection and another issue related to governmental records and the need or not to have uh, data localization requirements. So I think it's a very tricky question, but perhaps if we begin at the basics and, you know, just say use your official government issued system and not your own personal providers, this is already a good start, I think. I, mean, I think we have, uh, you know, I work for a modest size NGO and we haven't quite figured out how we're supposed to store. They've set up a, a system for us that we use perhaps not as well or as often as we should. And I can imagine the larger, more complex organizations being really troubled by, uh, by this. Uh, Rodrigo, access to information, government records that are held on the cloud. How, uh, is that something the council is, has had to deal with so far? Yeah, I mean, um, there, is, there is a reality right now. And we, we, we have a lot of records on the cloud right now. Um, internally, say, and, and especially in the public bodies too, in the public bodies of the administration. And we are dealing with, um, and, and we are pushing uh, for so, so hard. and, and for, for a new regulation under the protection in Chile. We, we have a regulation from 1999. It's very old. Uh, so it's, we are facing um, the lack of enforcement problem, very, very uh, strong. And now um, we are dealing with a major problem right now because uh, the cloud-based solutions are very, uh, far from the public Chilean regulation so far. So um, I think that um, the recommendations that we could, could, could do as, as, as a council are, uh, are very weak at the moment because we are, we're, we're not uh, joined by a, a strong uh, legal framework. So um, we are trying to push for uh, for for a new regulation is an is a, is an urgent measure to to take uh, to to face that reality. I have to be sincere. Okay, so that's uh, another thing that we need to fix. Uh, yeah, collectively the the different uh, the, the different communities. Um, and on information security, that was one that. Uh, we, we mentioned about document security and, and, and high levels, but I mean, the, the, the problem of computer security has been around since there's been computers, uh, 1980s, uh, you know, the computer hackers sort of started emerging on the scene on a regular basis. And uh, quite recently, we've seen a lot of attacks, ransomware attacks now and uh, that seems to be becoming a, a new trend. So you know, how, do we, how do we fit that in with the desire also to be open 
and to protect personal data and not collect too much of it if we've got to really highly secure these systems at the same time. Why don't you start since you're on the, on the screen now, Rodrigo. Yeah. Uh, and I think that is a, is a, is a good problem, I think. And uh, the digital governance in Chile, we didn't have yet an agency for cybersecurity, but uh, we are facing a lot of uh, attacks by hackers right now. Not a major attack, but we have a, a good level of, of protection right now. Um, but in terms of... Um, uh, there, there are some some vulnerabilities that that we are going to, you know, to, to face, uh, especially in terms of the of the COVID nineteen pandemic. There's a lot of digital procedures right now uh, that that uh, has to be affected. Um, health procedures, the 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 the, 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 the transit uh, permits that you, that, that you have to need to 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 go in the streets. And um, it, it, it has been attacked twice, I think, the, the central system of, of, the, of the public administration, but not with uh, major dangers, but uh, it, 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 it has to be attacked too. I, mean, I think uh, it has to be a, a very big problem to deal with. Okay. Uh... Miriam, based on your past lives working for the ministries of, of, of telecommunications, and you probably had to deal with this one uh, uh, pretty, pretty often too. Any thoughts on the, how we improve computer security without uh, wrecking everything else in the process? Yeah, this is another interesting point where many times we see a sort of tension between security and privacy because perhaps security can be promoted by having greater visibility over what happens within a network and on the other hand this may negatively affect privacy so this is a classic you know discussion within a, a legal literature but i think from a more uh, practical standpoint uh, especially when we're discussing governmental data or data that is handled by civil servants um, in Brazil, we have taken steps over the last years in order to increase our, leave, our, our level of maturity uh, in this aspect. So we have very recently approved a national information security policy, also a national cybersecurity strategy. And in fact, yesterday I heard that Brazil had actually uh, improved its position in the global cybersecurity issue, uh, index issued by ITU because we have in fact been gradually working on establishing this uh, legal framework in order to bring clearer parameters on how uh, data should be handled and, and treated uh, here in the country. That being said, we have also suffered from a number of attacks over this last year. We have had denial of service attacks. We have had ransomware attacks involving also the judiciary branch. And of course, this is something that you know, provides for great concern because I think the fear is that we would have public records that would be forever lost. And this, of course, is very damaging to our history as a country, the, the way of keeping track of what in fact happened and may, of course, also affect citizens' rights, especially if there are documents that are part of administrative or legal procedures. So um, I think there is no uh, easy solution to this. Um, and in fact, I think um, here in Brazil, at least at the federal level, many steps have been taken in order to create these governance structures and these internal policies to ensure that data is more uh, protected. But also, I think it's, it's fairly commonplace to say that the weakest link is always at the end, you know, the end user who forgets to lock his computer screen when he leaves to have a coffee break or that leaves important documents lying on the paper on, on his desk. Um, and I think this is also something that we have seen in, in home office settings because, uh, and there we have, you know, the two sides of it. On one side, I am here within my home office discussing important governmental issues and my family members are listening in because we don't have, you know, huge separate offices for each member of the family. On the other side, uh, people have suddenly gained visibility into my home settings, my children, my family life, my pets, and this is something that is also perhaps not ideal. So I think there, uh, there needs to be a, a great deal of thought put into how to balance these different issues. And as we have worked you know, on providing these uh, improved governance structures for dealing with information security issues, 
within our, our official work settings, we also have to put some thought into dealing with these issues in our home office settings. I mean, in, in the UK, we, uh, we just leave classified documents usually at bus stops, and that resolves the issue of both access <laughs> and security, um, no matter how sensitive they may be. Um, Anthea, did you want to uh, add anything on the, on the issue of information security? It's not really my area of expertise. Okay. I think this is really more <laughs> Rodrigo and Miriam's area, so I'm going to bow to their uh, to their knowledge on this one. Fair enough. Uh, we have a few minutes left, so I think maybe uh, if any of you want to have any parting comments, if you want to say anything uh, desperately that's not come out yet, or to to sum up uh, any any major points. Uh, why don't we start with you, Anthea, since you spoke last? Thanks. Um, I think, you know, as I said at the conclusion of my presentation, you know, this is an ecosystem. Um, we, it, 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 everything is depend, one thing is dependent on another. So the policy, the technologies and the eff efficacy of those technologies and ease of use um, but it's dependent on the, the policy structures that exist. And so we need to ensure that we have proper regulatory policy structures that facilitate teleworking and hybrid working and ensure that material decision-making is captured. I think we need to come to grips with, as a community, how we're gonna work with artificial intelligence. Um, I think it's kind of, they, it's kind of part of our discussion because we're gonna have to point these technologies to different silos still. Um, when we do access to information, and it's all part of that ecosystem, we're not going to be able to do proper access to information in a digital environment if we don't have a handle on the information, where the information is, how it's being kept, and how it's being captured. Thank you. Um, Miriam, why don't you go next? I think Anthea raises a really interesting point when she when she mentions that we also have to think about how technology can help us to um, keep track of what is going on uh, in public records as they are increasingly digital. And in fact, I think she she makes a very correct point when she mentions that it's humanly impossible to read the amount of documents that are created and artificial technology, artificial intelligence can help us and work in our favor. On the other hand, as a privacy professional, I have to point out that when we have digital documents, when we have technologies based on big data, artificial intelligence, analytics, and so on, working to extract information, we are also creating new categories of risks. And in this sense, uh, we have seen in Europe, for instance, a debate on the right to be forgotten re regarding public records, which I think is super interesting and also super complex. And if I'm not mistaken, in this particular case, the decision was um, that there is in fact no right to be forgotten with regard to public records, but there may be the possibility of making these records less easily accessible. So instead of keeping them open on the internet, keeping them somewhere you know, within a public department in order to also preserve aspects of the human personality that maybe are not so relevant after a long period of time has passed. So um, I would like to endorse her comments on the need to think about how technology can assist us, but also send this cautionary note as to how we also need to take care of, you know, establishing the necessary safeguards so that one right does not in fact uh, inadvertently uh, harm another right, which also has a social and a collective dimension. And just, you know, as a parting remark to say thank you once more for the invitation. And it was lovely discussing this, these issues with you, David, with Antian, with Rodrigo, and I hope we have more opportun opportunities in the future. Thank you. Uh, Rodrigo, you get the final word almost. Oh. Thank you very much, David. And um, no, I mean, I, I want to stress only the, 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 the idea that it's important to, to, to consolidate and to create an ecosystem of transparency and data protection in, in the region, especially. I mean, to speak uh, about Latin America in particular, uh, we, we have to, um, to consider the, the need to align our our implementation policies, especially uh, in the region, uh, try to coordinate the different centers of government as a key issue uh, to, to have a strong uh, uh, information, public information policy um, and data protection and trying to harmonize all, all of, of the things and the new things emerging 
um, and the need of cooperation here is uh, fundamental, I think. Um, and, and it's lovely to, to be with Miriam and Nancy and you, David. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, well, we're just at the end of our time. Uh, I've been, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the panelists. Uh, it's, I think, been a, a really interesting discussion covering a wide range of issues. So I think we've we've had a, a an interesting discussion that would be very good over a bottle of Kasasha, but maybe that will be a another year that the uh, that the commission will uh, the, the ombudsman will invite us all down to Brazil to have that discussion. Um, I've also been asked to say that the next webinar, this is a series, and the next webinar is going to be on the 28th of July on the issue of transparency and privacy and health issues. So again, that will be a very interesting discussion. And uh, I hope to see you all again in the future. Thank you. And.